Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's almost good evening. Sorry for the delay in starting today for reasons beyond our control. But welcome to our event about scaling up restoration and bringing down poverty. My name is James Allen. I work as a facilitator in Brazil, where I facilitate working groups aimed at implementing the Forest Code, which is a large government initiative to promote restoration and reforestation in Brazil. It's a very exciting time to be working with res restoration. It's a critical time as well. I think a lot of the things that we've been hearing today are about some of the changes that are happening at government level. We see a change in political will towards restoration. Uh, we've seen new legislation in countries like Brazil and in the Congo Basin, and we're going to hear about those today. Uh, and we're increasingly seeing a mobilization of finance towards restoration initiatives. But of course, there are a lot of challenges as well. So how do we turn these policies into practical actions on the ground? What are the sort of in incentives that exist for farmers and other landowners to implement restoration initiatives? Is there a link between restoration and poverty alleviation? And what sort of funding mechanisms are available for restoration activities? So it's a real pleasure to have this fantastic group of speakers here with us today. Um, we're going to try and answer some of those questions through specific cases of restoration initiatives in Brazil and in the Congo Basin. Uh, so I'd first like to pass over the floor it's a great pleasure to have here Minister Maria Fátima de Jardim, who is the Minister of the Environment of Angola. Um, Minister Maria Fátima, I hand you the floor. Bonsoir. Je peux voir qu'il y a beaucoup de personnes qui ont pas français et aussi anglais et portugais comme nous hein? dans mon pays nous parlons portugais mais nous sommes nous avons une division même parce que au nord il y a beaucoup de personnes qui parlent français et au sud beaucoup de personnes qui parlent anglais mais la langue officielle d'Angola c'est le Portugais. Alors, Angola, c'est un pays, je pense que quelquefois, c'est un pays différent. Euh, pourquoi Parce que c'est un pays qui a, en premier lieu, un peuple merveilleux, euh, différent écosystème. Et qui, à partir de cet écosystème, nous avons les forêts et le dessert. Et c'est un mélange entre le français, le portugais et l'anglais, comme les langues. C'est un mélange de, de euh, questions pour préserver. Mais aussi, nous, sommes, nous avons une histoire euh, incroyable que se mélange avec le monde. Et nous sommes gays parce que et Jessica a préparé ça pour nous parce que nous sommes en France et nous pourrions ici en France dire que ici à France tout le monde peut penser à propos des forêts, à propos des planètes, à propos de ce qui va représenter l'alliance entre la nature et entre la responsabilité de l'homme pour cet important accord que tout le monde pense à Paris. Alors, je devrais même féliciter tout pour ça. Et nous sommes sûrs que la responsabilité qui tout nous, après cet événement, on a porté sur, sur le dos, et ça signifie ce qui c'est la responsabilité de vous présenter euh, avec honneur l'initiative 
une initiative qui a créé le comité transfrontalier des ministres de l'initiative Mayom. Qui c'est Mayom Mayom, c'est une forêt. Quatre ministres de cette euh, importante région qui se mélangent entre le centre africain et, et la région sud-africaine, subsaharienne, on a euh, adopté et on a propos à son président euh, qui la, la protection des forêts tropicaux, c'est très important pour le monde et c'est très important pour le climat, mais a été très important aussi pour ce qui ce sont les défis des Africains et les défis des pays moins développés à propos de ce qui ce sont maintenant la lutte pour le développement, le progrès et le bien-être du monde. Alors, dans les forêts, nous avons les pauvres, nous avons la biodiversité, mais nous avons aussi les gorilles, nous avons des éléphants. Nous sommes mélangés. Et c'est la vie qui se mélange et qui s'ajoute. Il y a quatre pays qui sont maintenant les pays des initiatives. Angola, le Congo, euh, l'RDC, la République démocratique du Congo, le Gabon, et qui, Saint-Omé, Cameroun, on voudrait s'ajouter à cette initiative et aussi nous pourrions voir que c'est une jeune initiative, mais c'est une contribution incroyable pour ce qui représente la restauration des forêts dégradées, réduction de la pauvreté, et évolution et opportunité des risques entre les forêts du monde. Alors, je devais même remercier la présence de, du Brésil parce que eh, tous nous, on a, on a l'intention de coopérer et, co et, et faire une collaboration très étroite entre le monde parce que, comme vous savez, il y a trois forêts importantes dans le monde. Mayombe, Amazones et Mekong. Je voudrais tenir... La, la possibilité de parler un peu à propos de forêt Mayom. Dans cette forêt, il y a la variété du climat, mais aussi le climat euh, est lié avec la pauvreté, la conservation des forêts. Et il y a l'urgence d'une collaboration coopérative et, et évidemment un compromis entre nos générations. Nous aussi, sont, avons l'impression que l'initiative de Mayomb est une perspective de restaurer et conserver l'intégrité de la biodiversité, renforcer la stabilité régionale et améliorer les conditions de vie des populations qui vivent dans cette forêt. La restauration de paysages devrait passer aussi pour une meilleure planification interdisciplinaire des différents usages et surtout pour l'intégration et approche multidisciplinaire et intersectorielle. J'ai un document que j'ai préparé pour vous. Euh, je crois que l'audience, c'est une audience très spécialisée. Vous connaissez parfaitement qui c'est l'importance des forêts du monde. Alors, mais nous sommes ici y être convaincus qu'avec cette alliance, nous pouvons tenir la collaboration et la coopération ce que l'initiative mérite, l'initiative Mayomb. Pourquoi Parce que nous avons besoin de la capacitation, coopération, mais aussi de financement. Alors, c'est au sein de cette audience que nous devrions continuer avec l'initiative et les quatre pays, on peut ici euh, être convaincus qu'avec vous, dans vos cœurs, Mayomb peut représenter une initiative qui peut aider dans cette COP pour qui le climat, on peut aussi participer avec la justice de ce qui est. C'est la reconnaissance des forêts tropicaux parce que jusqu'à maintenant, les forêts tropicaux ne sont pas, n'ont pas jusqu'à maintenant compensé pour être les forêts plus préservées du monde. Merci beaucoup, Jessica.
pour ça. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Et je voudrais vous dire que, comme président de l'initiative Mayom, nous continuons à tenir l'initiative comme un instrument de ce qui signifie cet événement qui nous, avec euh, honneur, en nom d'Angola, on a participé. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Minister Fatima. Um, unfortunately, Minister Isabella Teixeira and Minister Jombo were not able to join us today because of other commitments with the United Nations. But we have a lot of other excellent speakers from Brazil and from the Congo Basin who are going to be able to tell us about some of the experiences from there. Um, it's obviously a complex project that you have in the, in the, in the Congo Basin region, Minister. Um, you have challenges around some of the technical issues of implementing restoration and biodiversity initiatives, and of course you have institutional challenges as well, working with these four countries. So I'd like to pass uh, the microphone over to Augustino Chikoa, who is the sec executive secretary of the Mayombo Initiative. So he's responsible for overseeing the implementation of this initiative in the, in the four countries, and I think we're really interested in hearing about some of the challenges that you faced in implementing such a complex project. Thank you. Uh, I will speak also, uh, good, good afternoon, I will speak also in French. Uh, je m'en vais tout de suite pour faire une connexion, c'est qu'a dit Madame la Ministre, uh, montrer le défi actuel, si vous voulez, de l'initiative transfrontalière. Uh, uh, l'initiative transfrontalière Mayom regroupe finalement uh, quatre pays, l'Angola, la RDC, le Congo et le Gabon. Uh, une part Du, de la partie sud du bassin du Congo jusqu'à l'embouchure du fleuve Congo. Le, le, les responsables politiques se sont rendus compte que euh, pendant la dernière décennie, euh, ils faisaient face à des défis transfrontaliers, des défis dont les solutions dépendaient de la mise en œuvre des efforts communs entre euh, tous les États. Ce qui fait que c'est une initiative récente, en 2009, Euh, elle a été, ils ont signé euh, le premier accord et en ce moment, il y a un nouvel instrument juridique un peu plus contraignant euh, qui permet qu'on puisse évoluer vers l'institutionnalisation de ce qu'on appellerait la COGEMA, c'est-à-dire la Commission pour la gestion de la forêt du Mayombe. Euh, euh, le Mayombe, ce n'est pas tout simplement un ensemble des aires protégées, mais c'est avant tout aussi si vous voulez, un paysage, mais un paysage où vous trouverez euh, des exploitations euh, forestières, des exploitations minières, des établissements euh, humains, ce qui fait qu'il faudra une autre gestion. Et les instruments, de, et c'est pour cela que je vais présenter en quelques mots un des instruments importants pour la gestion, euh, si vous voulez, euh, de cette forêt, que le plan quinquennal, un plan stratégique qui a été adopté par le pays membre, Et, et puis, euh, 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 si vous voulez, euh, un, un autre plan sous-régional euh, sur lequel nous sommes en train de travailler avec l'aide de la FAO. En fait, je dis au départ qu'il y a un problème, euh, euh, qu'on a des défis communs. Euh, vous le remarquerez, là c'est au niveau de la frontière entre l'Angola la, et le Congo. Et vous verrez que de l'autre côté euh, de l'Angola, la forêt est bien conservée. Et de, du côté du Congo, la forêt a des petits problèmes. Mais c'est pourquoi C'est parce que au, au moment où il y a eu la guerre, les gens qui étaient du côté de l'Angola sont venus du côté du Congo parce qu'après tout, euh, euh, c'est le même peuple, c'est comme les animaux, ils n'ont pas de passeport pour traverser. Eh bien, il y a eu une forte pression du côté du Congo. Alors, ceci a interpellé les autorités politiques de commencer à fédérer les efforts pour une gestion euh, un peu plus judiciaire. Et la crainte euh, euh, que les autorités avaient, et si euh, on ne pouvait pas euh, joindre les, les efforts, on craindrait que cette situation pourrait arriver aussi euh, de la même façon qu'on qu a vécu au, au, au Congo, que cela puisse arriver aussi en Angola. Oui, ça c'est là. Tu peux continuer Oui. Donc, euh, oui, tu peux continuer En fait, euh, le plan stratégique qui a été adopté par le, le quatre ministres, euh, a obéi 
tout un processus, un caneva euh, 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 en accord avec euh, le format général euh, de, de, du réseau des aires protégées euh, de, de centrale Albertine Riff, parce que c'est un caneva que nous utilisons tous en, en Afrique centrale. Et on est passé par d'abord euh, une analyse et une évaluation des forces et faiblesses, euh, les possibilités, les opportunités, les menaces, et, et souvent euh, le, 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 les menaces, euh, comme vous le savez, tel que l'a dit Madame la Ministre, une des grandes menaces, c'est la pauvreté. Vous trouverez que dans ce même écosystème, il y a beaucoup euh, euh, de gens qui y vivent, mais ils sont majoritairement pauvres. Donc, qu'il fallait quand même euh, 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 faire une, une planification pour euh, l'usage. Parce qu'une des questions clés dans ce débat, c'est voir comment est-ce que la restauration euh, euh, ou le reboisement peut contribuer, si vous voulez, à l'amélioration des conditions de vie des populations. Et aussi, lorsque ce reboisement ne pas bien conduit, certainement qu'elle pourrait conduire aussi à d'autres initiatives qui n'ont pas donné succès. Donc on a inventorié 40 stratégies et ces 40 stratégies qui ont été identifiées autour des 10 objectifs stratégiques dont je vais rapidement décliner les 8 axes. C'est vrai qu'un aspect important de cette forêt, en dehors de sa biodiversité qui est endémique, parce que et, 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 et dans cette euh, contrée, euh, cet, cet espace transonal Mayom, et, 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 en dehors de, 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 de cette flore qui est parfois endémique, parce que certaines espèces n'existent que là-bas, vous trouverez aussi euh, qu'il y a une population qui est le peuple Yomé, qui est le même dans les quatre pays. Et, 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 et c'est intéressant, surtout pour l'aspect culturel. Euh, euh, il y a, euh, si vous voulez, les priorités nationales, euh, et ce sont euh, quatre États euh, euh, qui mettent en commun les efforts et qu'il faudrait harmoniser la législation euh, pour qu'en créant cette. Parce que l'idée de, de, des autorités, c'est qu'il faut créer une aire protégée qui serait la plus contiguë possible. Euh, euh, et et euh, voir aussi. Euh, 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 un pilier important qui est la stabilité régionale euh, euh, au, au niveau de cette zone qui a été dans le passé une zone de conflit. Oui. Les fameux axes dont je parlerai, euh, ils sont là. D'abord, il y a un cadre politique institutionnel. C'est pour cela que nous avons fait plusieurs études euh, pour dénicher tout ce qui pourrait être comme barrière euh, dans cette perspective de la création de, 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 de l'ère transfrontalière du Mayom. Mais il y a une question aussi de la gouvernance et des droits communautaires. Et, et comme vous le savez, euh, 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 ce sont quatre États et, 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 et euh, euh, parfois il y a des faiblesses au niveau de la gouvernance locale des ressources naturelles. Et, mais les, les populations locales, parfois, ils, ils ignorent les, certaines potentialités qui pouvaient euh, 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 leur aider à changer de vie. Il y a l'aménagement et l'espace de gestion durable. Euh, on a proposé euh, que cet espace soit géré comme une aire protégée de la biosphère, compte tenu aussi de la dimension humaine et surtout de l'aspect la, du développement. Il y a le cadre juridique et l'application des lois. Et, et, et c'est vrai que euh, ce sont des États et, et chaque État euh, a euh, sa constitution, a son, euh, ses, ses, ses lois, mais on essaye de faire, euh, si vous voulez, des efforts pour une harmonisation qui permettrait que euh, dans le processus de la création de la réserve transfrontalière, qu'il n'y ait pas euh, des obstacles. Mais le plus important, nous pensons, c'est surtout euh, euh, le flux d'informations qu'il faudrait mettre à la disposition des acteurs clés, surtout que nous sommes en train de parler aussi de la restauration. Donc on pense que euh, toutes les barrières qui existeraient au niveau de cet espace Mayom, en ce qui concerne l'implication des acteurs clés, c'est peut-être sont des barrières qui seraient liées à un manque de connaissances. Donc, on, on trouve que la communication, l'éducation, le renforcement des capacités, de, tel que Madame la ministre l'a dit, ce serait un atout majeur pour donner un peu plus de viabilité, pourquoi pas viabilité économique, même si aujourd'hui, qu'on se le dise, on n'a pas fait beaucoup d'études pour savoir combien cette forêt reporte du point de vue de notre comptabilité nationale dans nos différents pays. Quel serait le nombre d'emplois direct et indirect qu'il crée Donc c'est un ensemble de questions. Nous pensons que euh, euh, je vais terminer avec le, le cadre du suivi parce qu'on euh, on prévoit, euh, euh, comme le, euh, ce plan stratégique a été, si vous voulez, de façon participative, qu'il faudrait un cadre stratégique. Voilà, et, et le dernier tableau, euh, il montre un peu les différents projets 
euh, qui sont connectés au, au plan euh, euh, stratégique. Donc nous sommes en train de, si vous voulez, on est en train de faire le fundraising pour que finalement Mayombe puisse être euh, 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 sur la reine de nos politiciens. Merci. Thank you very much, Augustine. Uh, I'd next like to pass over to Dr. Robin Chasden, who is the executive director of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. And most recently, she's been appointed uh, a senior research associate at the International Institute for Sustainability in Rio. Uh, Dr. Chasden, thanks for joining us today. And I think you bring a, a global perspective on some of the issues that we've, we've seen today. So pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm going to give a broad overview of um, how we can go about making some of these things happen on the ground and a little bit about what some of the broader policy goals are and focus a bit on some of the gaps, the knowledge gaps that um, are kind of impeding um, some of the implementation that we need to make. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that this is part of a group effort with uh, um, several collaborators. And um, a lot of what we worked on is going to make its way into my presentation. So we have all heard about the huge opportunity and demand for restoration around the world and the 2 billion hectares, but also um, the ecosystem services of our planet have been severely impaired to the uh, about 60% deteriorated according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So we have a huge need to correct this problem. And one of the first things people are, have done and what most uh, people think of when they think of restoration is let's plant some trees. Okay, the trees are gone, we, let's put them back. And I just want to say this is important but this is the easy part. It's easy to raise money to plant trees, and it's easy to build community support for tree planting because it's a way for communities to become actively involved. They get out there, they uh, are involved with the nurseries, they're involved in planting, uh, even the selection of trees. So this is all a wonderful way to build a community motivation and involvement in the restoration process. It also is creating jobs um, in many countries. In Brazil, there's essentially a, an industry now that is being built around uh, multi-species diverse plantings of, of native trees. And here you can see um, the collections of 50 species of trees in each of those boxes that are going out on the trucks and getting transported to restoration sites. Um, this is happening on a large scale. The picture in the lower right is a, a young forest about five years old. Every single tree you see there was planted. So uh, this is the hard part, is restoring the landscapes. And one of the obstacles we face is uh, understanding where do we start? Where, where are the priority landscapes for, for doing restoration? And I would just like a show of hands of people here. If you think this is a degraded landscape, raise your hand. Go ahead, raise your hand. So there's about half the people in the room think this is a degraded landscape, and about half aren't so sure. And that makes my point. Okay. So what is forest landscape restoration? We're talking here about a long-term process. This is not a quick fix. And here the goal is to regain ecological functionality and to enhance human well-being in some kind of landscape, whether it's very degraded or partially degraded or looks like it can be improved. So this is a large scale approach involving complex land use mosaics um, at the water sca watershed scale or even larger. It's forward looking. We're not trying to recreate the forests of the past. The focus is on really restoring provision of ecosystem goods and services and a foundation of forest landscape restoration is the active engagement of local stakeholders. Forest landscape restoration involves uh, several different restoration approaches, so it's not all one thing all over the place. It's, it's creating uh, a complex mosaic, um, and the various kinds of interventions are adapted to the local context, and they complement existing land uses, so it's not uh, 
an attempt to go through and completely transform a landscape back into forest, although that could be a component of landscape restoration. And when you describe it this way, it really is very much uh, consistent with all of the sustainable development goals. In fact, it embodies essentially the totality of these goals. So that alignment, I think, will go a long way um, in, in promoting the implementation of, of FLR. So in terms of the policy goals, um, what we've done is to outline six of them, but I'm only going to go through one due to limited time today. Um, but this paper will be coming out in conservation letters, and if you're interested, I can send you a preprint. The, the main policy goal in this case is to reverse effects of degradation through this widespread, long-lasting process. So this is a very broad goal. I, I think it, policymakers in any country would say, this is a good thing. Let's, let's try to do this. Um, and then what we have here is a depiction of the picture puzzle landscape with all the different actors and different uh, communities, different players, different stakeholders. And each of these different groups has questions. And these questions are basically um, our, uh, our knowledge gaps. Um, so for example, for rural and traditional communities, they want to know how can FLR provide jobs, promote local knowledge, promote their culture, improve their livelihoods, and increase ecosystem services. We don't really have an answer for them yet. Um, for the urban community, they want to know how will FLR improve the provision of water and water quality in the cities. The, the national governments, they need to understand or need to uh, get information on how can they uh, build the institutional frameworks and collaborative arrangements that they need in order to develop and implement these effective and very long-lasting policies. The knowledge that we need has to come from all kinds of different sources, um, not just uh, research, um, but also indigenous knowledge and uh, interdisciplinary knowledge, which is coming from all kinds of sources, um, literature knowledge, and know-how, which is really experiential knowledge. And finally, we need wisdom to really make this work. And I would just like to close with this image of a landscape because I tried to show you a photograph before and I realized that the definition of a landscape is a land that's too big to fit in a photograph. Um, but it can fit in uh, an embroidery. And, and here you can see a um, depiction of a landscape in Michoacan, Mexico, all the components that we're talking about. We have, we have natural areas. We have, we have some carbon emissions coming out of the house. We have rain. We have butterflies. Uh, we have agriculture. We have animals. Uh, and we have a lot of people. And um, we have to fit them all in to this structure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robin. OK. I'd like to move over to Brazil now and um, pass to Rodrigo Lima, who's the director of Agroecony, which is a Sao Paulo-based think tank. Uh, Rodrigo, I know you're involved in implementing projects that ask the question, well, if you've got competing use for land, how do you assuage the demands of farmers and also conservationists? So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you so much, James. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's a great opportunity, and uh, this last slide made, made my speech easier because defining what is a landscape, when, what is your, the different interests in, in a certain region, uh, it's very important when you're talking about this agenda of restoration. Uh, we're here at the, in, in a parallel event at the COP21. There's a lot of momentum trying to build up upon mitigation actions and adaptation and restoration is one of the ways to tackle this and the way the my, my, my aim here is to talk about uh, how how Brazil is managing this the Brazil experience and and the basis in Brazil to talk about restoration and as a context it, it is so important to to bring as a first issue that Brazil has a very robust regulation that brings restoration to the high level agenda uh, that is called the forest law, the former, the, the so known forest code uh, that requires restoration in private areas on farms. And 
when it comes to carbon, and we, we talk about carbon stocks on the forest already protected in the farms, but I just want to talk just about the restoration agenda. Carbon over there on the forest, natural vegetation is there, must be kept. This is part of the, of the Brazilian producing uh, reality. But restoration is the biggest challenge here, right? So when it comes to carbon, we're talking about uh, if you use the government uh, preliminary estimates of 12.5 uh, million hectares of areas to be restored, this must change depending on, on, on how the, the registry on the, on the forest code will, will move up and down. But if we assume 12.5 million hectares, we are talking about up to 4.5 billion tons of CO2 equivalent of carbon sequestration in the next two to three decades. This is huge. This is 14 times France's emissions. This is more than a EU's total emission. Uh, so this is a huge agenda. And it comprises the producers that must comply with the regulation. There's, and, and when we get to restoration, there's these huge gaps, everyone here was saying. And how to do that? How to build upon this agenda that is huge, that is totally connected to the SDGs, uh, to the... And the way we are approaching this at AgroEconomy, we have a project called Input, uh, land use initiative together with uh, the climate policy initiative uh, in Brazil. And the way we're doing this is to get knowledge, to get scientific backgrounds, experts doing research together with political engagement and together with stakeholder dialogue with the producing sectors, soybean, um, sugarcane, planted forests, and, and livestock. Because they are using land. Producers that searches for the different companies are using land, and we have a long chain up to the market. And we are trying to, based on this knowledge, we are trying to draw solutions to tackle the restoration agenda, to tackle the compliance agenda that this regulation brings to Brazilian producers. Uh, our goal is really to, to get to commitments, to get to steps that will be implemented, because we believe that working together with the different stakeholders, with the government uh, in, in, in different levels, we will be able to really move this agenda forward. And we need to ask some questions, for example, about economic restoration. It is crazy to think about economic restoration, or we're just talking about restoration for restoration, or it is possible to believe that we're going to have um, eucalyptus being planted in part as an alternative that we have in the regulation and to source um, eucalyptus to different sectors that relies on, on wood, for example. Uh, it's possible to think about small producers uh, becoming able to comply with the regulation because there's specific policies in place uh, trying to support these small producers. So there's a different bunch of questions. We are working with this and together trying to come up to solutions. And at the end, because I have just one minute, why to do that? Not just because it's a regulation in Brazil. This is because we have plenty of land in Brazil already being used. This is because there's a lot of pasture land to be restored. Uh, this is because restoration is part of our INDC. 12 million hectares of restoration, 15 million hectares of pasture restoration, which is bringing another 15 million hectares of degraded land to producing land is huge in terms of allowing better carbon balance and, and producing without no need for further deforestation. So this is huge in terms of uh, bringing to Brazil the ability to create probably the most uh, ambitious restoration project using the agricultural sector as the basis. 
there's all different aspects and projects that must be dealt with in terms of keeping forest. But this agenda, together with the, the, the agricultural sector, allows Brazil to really build upon what is sustainability in food production, creating a huge program of restoration that will, at the end, if really uh, implemented, create uh, an impressive mitigation adaptation agenda with uh, uh, positive benefits for thinking on, 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 on landscape for different actors uh, on this on this picture. So this is my message, and thank you so much. Thanks very much, Rodrigo. Next up, we have um, Bernardo and Agnieszka, uh, who are the co-founders of the International Institute for Sustainability in Rio. Um, uh, Agnieszka Latevic and Bernardo Strasbourg and I know that uh, the IIS has been doing some interesting research on, on land use patterns in Brazil. Uh, and I know, Bernardo, that one of the things you say is that the benefits of restoration clearly outweigh the costs. So one of the questions for you is, well, why are we not seeing more restoration? What's holding us up? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Greetings to all. Greetings to my co-panelists. Uh, and. It's a tough task to follow, uh, but also I think it was a brilliant introduction because what we plan to talk about, it's really about how do we, inspired by leadership policy makers as the example we had from Africa, by private sector entrepreneurship, and of course, from academic leadership and scientific and use the opportunity to express our greatest uh, privilege to work with the leading scientists in this area in the world since January, Robin. And the idea here is that we will show IAS experience at this over the last two years at exactly bridging and trying to connect science, policy and economics towards large scale restoration. Just a few words about um, IIS. So we are a think tank, officially NGO. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2009, and uh, we work with a range of, on, of projects uh, focused on sustainable land management. Uh, we work uh, with a range of collaborators. Some of them are, are, are here on this graph, but there are others. Um, and yeah, we are working with projects. We are working with science to support uh, public policies. and. Um, some more information is on the website. Yeah. And I think as an example of how we approach the science and policy interface and how things should really be uh, on both uh, directions, we bring uh, the example of the National Plan for Recovery of Nat Nature Vegetation, which is a plan that hopefully will be launched by the Brazilian government in the coming month connects with the NDC commitment of 12 million hectares of reforestation restoration is a plan to help, as Rodrigo mentioned, we have at least 12 million hectares to be restored for compliance purposes in Brazil. Uh, the latest estimates that as of last week put that number closer to 20, but that's dependent on several assumptions. And the plan was co-developed by the Ministry of Environment and by a scientific uh, working group, which uh, comprised of WRI, UCN, ourselves, uh, GIZ, and it was in Sao Paulo. And it was born out of message from science to policy, then was integrated into policy, and now science is trying to put it back into place. And I think it provides a framework for uh, the few minutes we're going to talk afterwards. The plan consists of eight strategies that are around awareness, seeds and seedlings, market institution, finance, rural extension, spatial planning and monitoring, research and development. Really, how do we make it happen, this large scale restoration? And us at IAS, we are uh, co-leading uh, half of these initiatives related to economics, spatial prioritization and science and uh, development. And talking about spatial planning first, a few examples on how it 
Planet Vega is both inspired by and inspired research we have been conducting on the topic of landscape restoration, hopefully relevant to other places as well. So I'll just briefly mention two recent studies that we conducted over the last uh, couple of years. Um, the first one is an interesting study of a um, Espirito Santo state uh, in Brazil. Um, it's an interesting case study because it has both plans to increase the uh, agriculture area uh, and uh, natural forest uh, cover area, and it doesn't have plans to increase the area of the state, so it actually needs to be accommodated in, in, in the same uh, for, um, yeah, area. Now, this leads, or this may lead, to competition for land, and we focused uh, on this topic in a paper uh, published recently in Frontiers in um, Ecology and the Environment. Toby is uh, one of the co-authors, he's here with us as well, and there's a number of um, other co-authors. Um, so, based on a model that was developed by IIS and Embrapa, uh, we found that uh, current pasture lands are only um, about 30% of the sustainable current capacity. And again, as uh, Rodrigo mentioned, uh, there are pasture land. It's a predominant land use in Brazil. Uh, they, are they are degraded, extensive pasture lands, and they have a scope and they have a potential to be managed in a better way. We are not talking about intensive systems. We are still talking about extensive or uh, improved um, uh, management. So um, basically increasing the potent, increasing uh, stocking rates in current um, um, pasture lands, we may spare land for reforestation. And this is actually, this is the first part was modeling, but we have also examples that this is actually already happening. So here is a farm on the left side um, uh, marked with letter A. It's a degraded uh, area, but with a high potential. So this is a pasture land with a high uh, potential productivity. Um, and then what happened, so there was a, a farmer, uh, together with some help, um, invested in, in soil, in better land management, so was able to basically accumulate um, cattle. Oh, one minute. Okay, I'll speed up. Basically, it's an example of land sparing, but it's a sustain through sustainable uh, intensification. And then the area B was uh, reforested. And then in another study uh, that was um, uh, coordinated by Bernardo, we showed that the same can um, hold for the whole Brazil. So we showed that Brazil has already enough agricultural air, uh, land uh, to meet all land-related demands uh, without further uh, deforestation. So uh, both of the studies um, uh, are available. There are hard copies outside, and also uh, you can download it from the uh, website. And uh, moving to the other two topics, too, and spatial planning, we are tasked now with helping the multi-criteria spatial planning because, it, as it has been made clear before, restoration is a new land use. When you're talking about large-scale restoration, you're potentially talking about competition for land and already land scarce environment. And again, restoration is more than one thing, as will be clear after when Roberto also uh, presents with us and possible many goals and the uh, but potentially many benefits and one of the most important elements to make sure all the values of restorations are maximized the costs are minimized is to put the right system of restoration in the right place and that's what we're going to be working with the ministry to produce uh, we're already starting to uh, design the priority maps for the Atlantic rainforest and the Amazon biomes, and we are with further conversations to try to make it viable to do it for the other four biomes uh, of Brazil. And now talking about economics for a bit, uh, we are talking really about several different systems from high diversity to commercial plantations and monoculture. All of them have, have their place. There are different purposes, different benefits, and different ideas of spatial allocations. And the trick is to go through all of them. Uh, just to quote one number for like a time, uh, we estimate that this 12.5 million hectares of restoration in Brazil will lead to the creation of 196,000 annual jobs for the next 20 years. And these jobs uh, benefit disproportionately the rural poor, and so it has a disproportionate impact on poverty reduction and inequality, which is quite an issue uh, in Brazil. Uh, as Rodrigo mentioned, 
Uh, on the other extreme, um, how can we create uh, wealth from restoration in some areas where that is the most appropriate management system? We have here four examples that we have developed in, with partnership with others. They are re four restoration systems exclusively of native species together with uh, some native species of commercial timber value. We're managing between one third and half of the area, not more than that. And even in these cases, we find competitive rate of returns uh, compared, for example, if extensive cattle ranching, any of these systems beat extensive cattle ranching, which is 75% of Brazilian uh, land use. And now for the last topic of research and development, uh, we briefly also, inspired by Robin, we see a huge role for natural regeneration in Brazil. There is a, a document available outside and PDF on our website on how can it really help to decrease costs and even improve benefits in some places. And on this topic as well, our future research will focus on uh, uh, providing guidance for policymakers. And um, basically, we will be comparing benefits of different restoration methods. We'll be looking into carbon, uh, social aspects, in impacts of, of water. Um, and just before wrapping up, uh, uh, I'd like to mention our new um, product of IIS. Uh, it was actually, uh, it's a book that will be published on Monday. It's in op uh, open access. Uh, it's called Sustainability Indicators in Practice. Um, anybody can download. Uh, basically, we discuss different case studies on the use of sustainability indicators. It's um, edited, co-edited by my um, colleague and friend uh, from <coughs> Kenya. And yeah, if anybody is interested, is just to go and download it. It's freely accessible. Uh, just so to wrap it up, I will not go through all of them, but obviously everybody is here because restoration has been identified as a possible major local and global solution to sustainability problems. It has many ecosystem services, which as we know, benefit the poor disproportionately. It's important that frameworks are put in place to internalize part of its external benefits. Large-scale restoration requires thinking about land scarcity and possible competition to avoid leakage. Nonetheless, we show that a smart prioritization uh, can lead to all of these uh, achievements, the urgent need to increase science, economics, and policy dialogue. With that, we conclude. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Bernardo and Agnieszka. And last but not least, our final presenter today, before we hand over to you to ask us some questions, is Roberto Vag. Roberto represents the Brazilian coalition here at the, the COP and the, GL, uh, the GLF. Uh, but interestingly, Roberto is also the chairman of, of Amata, which is a wood production company. So he has direct experiences of restoration and trying to commercialize uh, 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 would uh, pro produce from Brazil. So I think we're really keen to hear from you, Roberto, particularly around issues about incentives. You know, how, how do we make all this commercially viable? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. So this time I will not talk about the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forest and Agriculture, which is a very important movement in Brazil that is creating a critical mass to deal with the implementation of, uh, of the Brazilian Forest Code, uh, deforestation, and the reforestation agenda. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I believe the, the first uh, message is that uh, the, 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 the reforestation agenda uh, uh, must include uh, different types of forests. I think this is a very important message. We keep uh, trying to defend the different types of forests in, in, in different forms. And the way we see it is that there is a continuum of different types of forests, all of them uh, uh, of uh, huge value depending on uh, the purpose of, uh, of, of this forest. Uh, the, 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 depending on the type of uh, forestry, you can uh, uh, start from, let's say, on the left side, uh, natural regeneration, which will cost something around uh, $300, uh, $400 uh, per hectare, to the other side, let's say, to the right side, something that is what we call the intensively managed plantations of monoculture uh, uh, that will uh, require something like uh, $3,000 per hectare. In the middle, you may have 
what is the new frontier of the forestry, which is the plantation of native trees, especially plantation of a mixed uh, culture of uh, native trees. And uh, there's a lot of questions about the cost of this type of activity, varying from uh, $1,000 to $5,000 or even more. So the discussion of uh, the cost of the implementation of this type of reforestation, which is a mixed uh, native forest reforestation, is a big question in, in, the, in the whole uh, uh, reforestation or forest arena, right? Uh, well, uh, some important concepts. First, uh, all, the, all, the, all, all types of forests, uh, they have uh, basically, they provide basically three types of, of products. First, the environmental service, second, the non-timber products, and third, the timber products. Non-timber products of major importance on food security, environmental service, we don't need to explain, it's very clear, the importance of environmental service. But basically, the mainstream investors, they recognize the value of the timber in the forest industry. Basically, the majority, vast majority of uh, the economic uh, interest of uh, the forest in the, in the economic uh, field is uh, focused on, on timber. And uh, why? Why timber? And why the mainstream investors, they focus on this right type of uh, 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 right hand type of forest, which is the uh, intensively managed forest and, or inten intensively managed uh, plantations? Uh, because this is very predictable. There is a very uh, organized market. Uh, the uh, many uh, different uh, benchmarkings on costs, on the economic indicators. You have a huge amount of investors interested in that. Around 6% of the real assets of pension funds in the world, they have investment in this type of, uh, of forest, which is, again, predictable type of forest, right? They are not investing in the tropical native tree plantations or native tree reforestation. You almost don't see them, the mainstream investors, playing in the field of uh, tropical forest reforestation. Why? I think that is one of the things we must address very clearly and very precisely. First, there is, a, there is an issue related to the market conditions of tropical timber. The market conditions of tropical timber basically is dominated by huge illegality. So when you address the, the international market of tropical timber, you will find that at least in Brazil, 80% is illegal or has some type of illegality. So we need to solve that. There is no way to attract investors into plantation of native trees on the scale we need if we don't solve the illegality situation, the illegality market of uh, tropical timber. And that is basically happening in the whole southern hemisphere. The, the other point is that uh, we don't have the silviculture knowledge of plantation of native trees. We don't know the growing curves of the different species. We have very few experience and experiments on that. So uh, the predict predictability of uh, the growth of the tree is uh, unknown. So the spacing situation, fertilization, all types of uh, discussions on harvesting, everything, we, don't, we just don't know. We have a good experience here and there, but we need to build a very bulky science-based knowledge on the silviculture of native trees. So the first is market, the second is silviculture knowledge. The third point, is economic modeling. We don't talk the language of the mainstream investors. We don't understand them and they don't understand us. When we talk about biodiversity, when we talk about environmental services, everything is not in their economic modeling. So they have a very, very clear modeling for growth of uh, 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 fast growing trees, like uh, for pulp or for, or, for, or for panels or for energy. But uh, the, the whole economic equations for the tropical native trees is not there. It's something that we, 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 we are not prepared to talk to, let's say, the analysts of the mainstream investors. So this is another thing we need to develop. Very strong and very um, 
let's say, bulky uh, economic modeling on, on, uh, on that area. The fourth point is uh, final, uh, final uh, arrangements on the institutional development. Uh, we don't know exactly what we can do, for instance, in Brazil, in the legal reservation after restoring a, a, an area that we call legal reserves. So this is, should be a productive forest, but we don't know uh, how far can we go on, on the harvesting process. We don't know the size of uh, potential clear-cut areas. We don't know uh, how to combine uh, native species with, with uh, fast pioneer exotic trees. So this type of final arrangements on the institutional environment it must be achieved because otherwise you cannot do the modeling and if you don't do the modeling you cannot talk to the mainstream investors. If you don't talk to them, the money will be, will be not there. You can show very nice ideas and that's our case. Uh, on on uh, predictions of internal rate of returns, we can so or we can we can try to address that, but we don't have really large scale real case. The final point I believe is of major importance, and I'm I'm very happy that uh, uh, Mr. Pavel Sokodev is here and, and uh, he's working very hard on that, which is the value of externalities. Everything we talk about. Uh, plantation of native, native trees depends on the addition of this concept of different values of the native trees that can be, uh, can be added to the economic model and can be, and can, can be understood by the, uh, the financial analyst of the mainstream area. So we really need to work on the market, we need to work on the silviculture, we need to develop, further develop the whole uh, institutional environment, no doubt about that. And uh, we need to work on the economic, uh, uh, economic equations of the externalities, especially the positive externalities that comes from the native tree plantations. And with that, we need to address then the economic modeling and then we'll be able to talk to the mainstream investors and make this thing happen. Of course, there are many different options uh, to uh, address and to find uh, um, uh, financial sources uh, to, let's say, implement the agenda. But without uh, bringing the mainstream investors into this game, it will be very difficult to, to achieve the scale we are planning on the agenda of native tree plantations and, and restoration. So thank you very much. Thanks, Roberto. I think that closes off really nicely. I, I know that we've got in this room, we've got economists, we've got members of the government, uh, we've got investors. Uh, so we've all got work to do and I hope we all feel a sense of urgency about the work that's got to be done now. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity, we've got about half an hour um, to ask, to open up the floor for questions. Um, I'd like us to take three questions initially. Um, we'll take them together. Uh, pass over to the panel and let them answer that and if we've got more time we'll take more questions so if you have any questions um, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you just to keep the logistics simple there's a gentleman here at the front in the blue shirt there's a lady right at the back in a blue shirt and then there's a gentleman here in a blue jacket with a yellow shirt So would you like to go first? Yeah, uh, the, the uh, uh, Sergio Margulis from Brazil. A uh, question to Roberto. Uh, do you think that the uncertainty and the all these problems that you raised does how uh, incompatible that might be with the promised INDCs of Brazil? Is it? Uh, I mean, given all the difficult uh, technical challenges, apart from all the economics, etc. Uh, promising 12 or let alone 20 million hectares of reforestation. Uh, is that, uh, where are we here? We have an enormous challenge. It's a big challenge, but I think we can face. And the, the, the reason is that uh, Brazil has the basic, the, 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 what we call the, the, the technological platform to develop 
silviculture of trees. So we've done that with uh, exotic trees. So why not uh, going on uh, the same process with uh, native trees? Uh, second, the market for uh, different species is expanding. Uh, you know, the, the biomaterials market is something that is booming now. So the possibilities of new types of fibers uh, can be really uh, further explored. So I believe that we have the market, the global market for what we are proposing is there. Uh, the, the, the technological platform we have, we have the institutional environment which is the forest code. So the demand, the legal demands there, the market demands there. So the, the, the thing is, in my, way, my, my view, is really to work very, on a very focused way. We need to have a very strong policy on the development of a pre-competitive R&D on silviculture of native trees. We need to solve the illegality situation. If we don't solve, there is no way. But if we address that, I, have, I, I, I believe that is a big challenge, but it's achievable. It's something that we can really achieve. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Bernardo, I know you have something to add to this. Just very briefly. Uh, and, uh, of course, everything Roberto says, it, it's completely valid. Also, just to make up that the huge numbers also have to do with the scenarios we've been developing, is that about between 40 and 70 percent of that 12 to 20 million will be achieved to different types of nature, uh, natural regeneration and passive uh, restoration. So we're really talking about, about four to seven million hectares of, of plantation, which is still a lot and a huge challenge but hopefully uh, about half of that being achieved through nat uh, natural regeneration. Lady at the back. Uh, so, um, it's Isabel Garcia from Sao Paulo University, Brazil. Uh, my question is about payment for environmental services. It's addressed uh, to Roberto and Bernardo, but uh, the others also. I think we all see an opportunity to put forward payment for environmental services, especially in, in Brazil. For FSC, it's, a, it's an important uh, issue also. But uh, what markets, markets are being created? Uh, what uh, you guys are foreseeing about uh, markets for environmental services? Yeah, this is one of, uh, the, one of the elements that will bring the whole economic equation into something that is uh, getting to the, let's say, field of uh, attraction of institutional investors. So we need to add payment of environmental service into that equation. I believe this is something that we can do together with the intensive managed uh, plantations. Uh, we have a very interesting approach like uh, the new generation plantations, the forest dialogue, FSC, all those people working together on the definition of uh, how the payment of environmental service can be established in, in the plantation arena. And uh, again, uh, this is one of the major elements uh, to bring this whole thing into, let's say, the radar of the mainstream investors. I am very positive. I think this uh, in this uh, last week we saw uh, that uh, the, the carbon pricing and the carbon economy and carbon taxation is taking momentum. So even if we don't, don't get to a final agreement, I believe that the sign is very clear that we are going to that direction. And this is of major importance to this, uh, to this agenda. Yeah. Yes, and complementing with, uh, uh, I think, uh, Roberto captured brilliantly the hope for the uh, global externality one of them to be partially internalized after, after Paris in the coming years. But what we also see in Brazil are the local externalities, specifically water. Brazil has been going through a severe water crisis, and the, there are very innovative payment for ecosystem service related to water popping out here and there. And in my opinion, we need both, and we need both in the same mechanism. And there is, uh, if you're going to internalize, you can internalize both global and local externalities to correct this market failure that has been hindering restoration landscape. Would anybody else on the panel like to? Thank you. If I may, may add one, one, one single point is that when we're talking about restoration and, and conserving natural vegetation, we're talking not just about Ber Bernardo just brought water as an extra issue that is very important. Roberto mentioned Mr. Pavansuktev here and, and all the externalities about 
uh, conservation. Uh, and, and, and again, I would like to, to come back to the, the last, last slide from, from Professor Robin with, with, with the image from Mexico, because we're talking about sustainable, about food production, we're talking about water, we're talking about uh, non-timber products, we're talking about livelihoods at the end in different scales, in different landscapes, in different perspectives. So uh, if we're supposed to build an agenda of restoration that, that we really, that is huge, we're talking about millions of hectares in different perspectives, it's gonna be passive revegetation, it's gonna be uh, as, uh, restoration in practice of dif different species, it's gonna be, uh, in, in the case of forest code, is 50-50, native and, and with uh, exotic species. At the end, we're talking about carbon, we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about the SDGs as a basis for this. This is the development agenda for the next 20 years at least that has been just approved by the, 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 the United Nations. So uh, payment for environmental services, it's, it's totally linked to this. It's a challenge, yes it is, but we, we need to build upon this and try to make it happen. This is one of, one of the reasons why we, we are working with this, with the private sector in Brazil to push the forest code on and, and to, to make it happen. No, yeah. Uh, one, I think one of the opportunities we have is the, what we call the soft-soft collaboration. And I believe that Brazil and, and, and Congo Basin has a lot of things to do together in the development of this agenda. So I'd like to bring that question to the panel because this is one of the key points of uh, the coalition, but also one of the key elements to the development of this agenda globally. Perhaps our colleagues from the Congo Basin could, could address that. You know, How do we, we, we... We've got all these great initiatives going on in four African countries around the Congo Basin, in Brazil. How do we start transferring technologies, expertise between these two areas? Merci. C'est vrai que nous avons deux réalités différentes. En ce qui concerne la question de déforestation et la question de dégradation. Dans le, dans le bassin du Congo, le taux de déforestation est autour de moins d'un pour cent. Alors que dans le bassin amazonien, c'est un peu plus élevé. D'ailleurs, c'est une des questions qui fait que le bassin du Congo ne parvient pas à bénéficier, si vous voulez, de tous ces apports, que ce soit avec les mécanismes propres et même aujourd'hui avec les mécanismes RAID. Et comment est-ce que nous pouvons euh, coopérer entre euh, euh, les initiatives euh, au Brésil et les initiatives et surtout euh, au niveau du bassin du Congo. Eh bien, cette coopération existe déjà. Et je dois dire qu'aujourd'hui, euh, euh, tous les experts qui travaillent dans le processus sur aide au niveau du bassin du Congo, ils sont en train de prendre une formation au niveau euh, euh, de, euh, de l'Institut Embrapa. Euh, donc, si vous voulez, tous les scénarios pour euh, euh, le, 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 les inventaires des émissions, l'actualisation des émissions, c'est appuyé par le l'Institut brésilien. Et nous pensons que ça, c'est déjà un pas très important. Et, et, et nous pourrons évoluer dans ce sens, de façon que ce transfert, parce que le grand problème que nous avons sur, dans le bassin du Congo, qui a fait comme option euh, euh, l'économie verte, euh, c'est le financement, si vous voulez, euh, de, de cette phase vers cette économie verte. Et, et je pense qu'au niveau du Sud, c'est possible qu'il y ait un entendement. Bien, je voudrais ajouter même les choses, parce que nous sommes au sein des réalités différentes. Il faut que tous nous, on peut comprendre ça. Même les personnes qui ont fait, qui ont demandé pour l'éclissement à, à tous nous, hein, la bassine du Congo, les forêts Mayon, n'est pas la forêt de Amazon. Mais nous pourrions tenir ici un exemple de coopération et expérience. Parce que, en effet, Amazon, c'est une forêt avec une procédure de gestion très correcte. Et nous pourrions tenir plus parce que la coopération sud-sud, c'est pour ça. Alors, c'est à cause de ça que je vous disais que la coopération, la collaboration, 
mais aussi la solidarité devait être dans nos esprits et nous sommes conscients que tous nous qui avons des forêts, nous devrions préserver parce que c'est l'obligation pour ce qui est l'avenir de nos générations. C'est seulement pour vous dire que nous avons besoin de tout, du Brésil et de vous qui sont présents. Les experts, les investisseurs, les... ce qui est la société civile, la bassie de Congo et la forêt Mayombe a besoin de tout vous. Merci beaucoup. Merci, M. Fatima. Gentlemen at the front there. Loic Lopez, um, Free Electron. Um, really, when I was young and at school, um, I was told, once the forest is gone, it's gone. Um, and now, we seem to be hearing, oh, you can restore it. There's no problem. Um, and of course, I'm simplifying things, but I would like to a bit have a, some few words of the expert, because I think most people outside of this community uh, may be under this impression And so if you want money, if you want a politician will, uh, then really this, answer, this needs to be answered. Well, I'd love to address that question. I agree. The word is not yet out there. Uh, we're trying. The scientists are really making an effort to, to do a lot of research. And it's very clear that there are many, many contexts in which the tropical forests do regrow. But it is a very long-term process. It doesn't happen in five years. So it is a little bit of a different way of thinking than planting trees where you, you have some kind of quick result. And um, this is where I think we need some transformational thinking about restoration and really um, viewing natural regeneration as a component under those situations where it's a go-go and the conditions are very appropriate. And that's where the spatial planning comes in. Um, and we now have, I think we have the tools to start to do this and to start to map out where it's most likely that natural regeneration will happen, will happen well, will happen in ways that are really enriching the landscape and providing ecosystem services without having to plant trees. And then the funds can be allocated to those situations where the tree planting is really needed or other kinds of, of investments. So um, we're trying to get the word out um, in a number of ways, and uh, we need everyone's help with this because talk it up. It really is um, the next greatest thing. Did, did you want to take something, Agostino, Roberto? Okay. Any, any, let's, let's take one, one more question just before we ask the panel to, to give us some closing remarks. Lady at the back. We can get a microphone to you. Agostino? Uh, effectivement, on, 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 uh, juste pour, pour un suivi, uh, c'est vrai que la problématique de la uh, uh, restauration, uh, elle est vue un peu uh, sous, plusieurs, sous plusieurs angles. Au niveau... I think that uh, all of us, you prefer English. Is real or not? Agostinho, please speak in English. I am obliged to speak in English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Madam Minister. Uh, I think the, the, the most important is uh, uh, in our context is to understand that uh, uh, what we are doing in uh, Mayombe Forest, we, we, we just we, we, we use. We are using, for example, uh, the degraded uh, uh, land and degraded uh, land for just restoration, and uh, the potential land with uh, a wide level of uh, 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 carbon. We, we, we want to use it just for to satisfy uh, 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 our, the needs of our population. But uh, it is important in this stage. Uh, to, 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 to just to, to avoid all barriers because we found a lot of barriers in terms of investor to come uh, to do restoration in our context. Uh, we need uh, uh, some in, 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 incentive. Uh, for example, it is important to work uh, in our national legislation. It is important just to, to strengthen 
uh, all uh, national initiative in all countries uh, regarding how to support uh, 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 all initiative for uh, restoration. Uh, just a brief compliment, excellent question, and I think it's obviously a huge important, hugely important point to make clear that yes, forests can come back, restoration is the next best thing, but that cannot be used to justify that primary forest can be the forest, it's not a big problem, it will come back, that major time lags, the extinction risks and ecosystem services will suffer, people will suffer if you change primary forests for restored foliage, that's the final point. And a final question at the back, please. Okay, my name is Jennifer Schulz, I'm University of Potsdam, Germany. I'm wondering, going back to that question of the lady about ecosystem services and payments for that, um, what are we doing about the time lag between restoration and the time, the, the money that we need to initiate these processes? For example, even um, natural regeneration has a cost, the lost opportunity cost. So we need the money now to restore, but we have the services and environmental benefits in the long term. So how we do, are there any mechanisms to close that gap? Well, the view we, s we have on that is that we should, not, uh, we should not expect that the payment of environmental service will solve this equation. So it's part of the, the, the component of this equation, is one component. So what is needed is, uh, in the way we see, is to address the value of uh, timber, which is the recognized value by the investors, so this is another very important part of the, the equation. And bringing the timber component into a more long-term perspective. So the timber component nowadays is a very sh has a very short-term perspective. What we need to do is to bring into the development of this economic equation uh, the, the, uh, uh, a way to address the timber value on the longer term. So let's say, I will get the timber 15 years, uh, 50 years from now, 80 years from now, more or less the same thing that happens in the northern uh, hemisphere forests, in the Scandinavian forests, for instance. If, if the Scandinavian forest, if the value of a, 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 a timber is recognized in Finland, Sweden, uh, if, uh, with, a, with a perspective of 100 years or 80 years, why not do the same on the tropical forest? Why in the tropical forest we should expect to get returns in six years or 10 years or 12 years? So this is what I...